better muster your courage for the high dive, because you are splashing into the carpool. I'm your host, Stu Galetta. And I'm Kyle Robertson. And today we're talking about the top 10 money cards from Dissension. This is, of course, part two of our two-part set review. You can also check back to see our top 10 hidden gems of Dissension as well in our previous video. But without further ado, let's get on with our review. Let's indeed, Kyle. And we're going to start off at number one for the lovely price of $22, Infernal Tutor. It is a two-drop, one of anything in black sorcery. And it reads, reveal a card from your hand and search your library for a card with the same name that you revealed. Put that card into your hand and shelf your library. It also has an effect called Hellbent. If you have no cards in your hand, instead search your library for a card, put it into your hand, and then shelf your library. So right off the bat, this should seem very similar to Demonic Tutor in the fact that it is also a tutor, which it says in the name, and has the ability to search for other cards. This is better in other formats because Commander is a singleton format, meaning that, all right, the likelihood of you having a card that has the same name is very, very marginal. I don't think you'd really want to run a tutor that could only bring you a basic land, for example, to your hand. So, I mean, kind of niche. It warrants its price tag for other formats, and it could be a good card in Commander, but for you to make that deck, it'd be really, really hard. I don't really see a home for this card in Commander all that much for pretty much all the reasons we've already talked about. However, I could see this being good in places like Modern and other Eternal formats. I don't really have a lot of knowledge of it being played there, but I think it could be. The kind of going rate for a tutor like this these days that gets you any card from your deck to your hand is on Diabolic Tutor, and that's four mana for a sorcery. That's, like I said, pretty much the understood rate that a tutor for any card from your deck is worth. When you can get that kind of effect for two mana, like the old school Demonic Tutor, that is incredibly powerful, especially not even to the top of your deck, just right to your hand. I do kind of like this card for the fact that, obviously, if this was the only card in your hand and you got stuck with it, it's completely dead. However, there is the Hellbent ability, so if it ends up being the only card in your hand, it really isn't dead. And it, in fact, even gets better. That's good card design, in my opinion, and makes this card worthy of attention. In addition, the idea of redundancy should never be sneezed at, because get a copy of the best card in your deck to your hand for two mana, yeah, that seems pretty good to me. So, as I said, I don't really see this card being played a whole lot, but I could certainly understand why it has a price tag like this. So, moving right along to our number two on the list, our number two spot is actually shared by three cards, and they are, surprise, surprise, the Shocklands for Dissension. They are Hallowed Fountain, the blue-white Shockland, Breeding Pool, the blue-green shock land, and Blood Crypt, the red and black shock land. Each, of course, representing one of the three guilds that is represented in Dissension. And pretty much all of them, again, are lands that have both basic land types of the colors that they are, without actually being basic. And when they come into play, you can pay two life to have them come into play untapped instead of tapped. I really don't have to go into explaining why shock lands are good. We've been over it over and over and over again. These are slightly more expensive than the Return to Ravnica block versions because just for the fact that they are older and they are the originals, but shock lands are good. I don't really have that much more to say about it. Yeah, I agree with you, Kyle. Good lands, good for color fixing, tutorable. They're good. They're really good. Our number three slot... For $11 is Protein Hulk. It costs 7 mana, 5 of anything, and double green, and it is a beast. Whenever Protein Hulk is put into a graveyard from play, search your library for any number of creature cards with total converted mana cost 6 or less, and put them into play. Then shuffle your library. This card is also a 6-6. Six, six. So right there, we're looking at 7 mana for a 6-6 six, six that has a graveyard effect, or like a grave pact kind of effect that you'd want to see. Whenever it goes to the graveyard, you get a search for a whole bunch of creatures and put them onto the battlefield for free. So this is a really strong card in the fact that it gets you around a lot of mana costs, it grows your field, and typically if this is put into the graveyard and it's not by your design, that means somebody board wiped. So right there, this guy going from the grave rebuilds your field instantly when nobody else has another field. So that means when an opponent plays one or if you have multiple opponents, they have to decide when to sync up their board wipes to make sure your field is completely gone. And that right there is extremely strong and extremely powerful. 
We all know how stupid a card Revelark is. Protean Hulk is like Revelark times 150. This card just takes everything that is good about that whole outside the current board state card advantage thing and ramps it up to like 11. Fun fact, this card is banned in most formats imaginable just because of sheerly how broke it is. And there was actually a deck way, way back that was called Flash Hulk because this was one of the two ways that you won the game. You would play this old instant card called Flash that basically let you cast a creature from your hand for free. And then you would play Protean Hulk and something, 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 you win the game. Protean Hulk was banned in pretty much every conceivable format because of just how good that was, including Commander. But, fun fact number two... Protean Hulk actually was recently unbanned in Commander, so us Commander players now once again have access to one of the best creature-based tutors around. And honestly, looking at it, it's really, really good. That's very obvious, plain to see. But is it any more broken than some of the other dumb things that you can do in Commander these days? Probably not, so I honestly think it's safe for Protean Hulk to come back in a format like Commander. If you look at it, it is green, so you can get this out even sooner. Like, all right, you have Elfish Piper, you have Zoologist, you have Wasted Tutor with, like, the Commander. Mormir Vig is a great example of that. Worldly Tutor is a phenomenal thing. And again, green ramps. So, I mean, play Kodama's Reach. Play Cultivate. This won't be coming out turn 7. You'll be able to get this out a lot sooner. And there's also the clause that it does have to actually die, so if it gets exiled, you get nothing for all that work. And... As us Commander players know, pretty much the best removal in the format is Exile-based rather than Destroying. So, there are ways around Protean Hulk, to be sure. And, as I said, I'm sure I'm going to regret that pronouncement the second somebody plays this against me in Commander and does something incredibly broken with it, but I'm not all that scared of Protean Hulk. I respect its power, but I'm not deathly afraid of it like I would be something like Prophet of Crufix, and I think it's okay for Protean Hulk to be back in the game. Speaking of things that are not fun, I am going to go to our number four card coming in at $9, and one of my personal favorites from back in the day, Tide Spout Tyrant. This card is a whopping eight drop blue creature. It costs five and triple blue. It is a five five with flying. And it has the simple effect of, whenever you cast a spell, return target permanent to its owner's hand. That is pretty darn good. I really don't have to explain it too much, I think. But just think about that for a second. The closest thing that I can compare it to is Venser, the Planeswalker version. His ultimate is that whenever you cast a spell, you exile target permanent. While exiling is a little bit better than simply putting back in the hand like Tide Spout Tyrant can do, think about how many different things that can get rid of. It gets rid of virtually everything there is, including, but not limited to, lands. That's what makes Tide Spout Tyrant kind of unfun, because people's favorite thing to do with this card is just storm off, play a bunch of spells, bounce all the, your lands back to your hand, and then you can't do anything for the rest of the game. How fun was that? That said, Tide Spout Tyrant is a very powerful card, and I'm not at all surprised that it's still one of the priciest cards of this set. Yeah, it is really powerful, and you can go ahead and splash this into any deck. I have to agree with you. I think Storm would be good, so this would be really good in like a Mizzix deck, for example. The only thing that I see as a small downside is that it's 8 mana. So, I mean, yes, there's ways to ramp it and there's ways to bring it out, but you wouldn't bring it out onto the field unless you have a way to use its effect that turn. Even if you have a counterspell in your hand, you're not getting any value right then at that moment. You have to be able to wait and acquire it. So that's the only downside I really truly see for this card. But beyond that, it really is a powerhouse. I'm just going to stop there. Just imagine how powerful that is stapling on bounce any permanent back to its owner's hand on every single spell you play, regardless of how expensive it is, from zero mana cost up to whatever mana cost. I think this kind of falls into the same camp as Protean Hulk, where it's very expensive, but the payoff is well worth the investment in terms of playing it. And note that it's whenever you cast a spell, not whenever something enters the battlefield. So if you cast a spell, for example, and one of your opponents counters it, that doesn't stop this card's effect from going off. 
So it's pretty much going to happen no matter what anyone does unless they get rid of this card, which will have to happen very quickly. Going from one card that makes it so you can abuse stuff to being able to add control into a game, we're at our number five slot for the lovely price of $8, Void Slime. It is a three drop instant, a green and double blue, and it reads counter target spell, activate ability, or triggered ability. So right here, this is a very strong counter spell. So this card pretty much counters anything you really don't want to happen. If a creature enters the battlefield and uses its ETB effect, you can make it so it stops. If there's a commander about to use some sort of effect to synergize, you can make it so that stops. Or if there's a board wipe or a tutor spell, you can make it so that stops. It's a card that's very similar to Disallow in the fact that it has versatility for its countering. And for that ability, it is very, very strong to have in a deck. It's very similar to the cards that we see with modal abilities, because it gives you the factor of having the ability to make it so that stuff can fit to the perfect situation that you need. Cryptic Command is a great example of this. Merciless Eviction is a great example of this. And I mean, there's reasons why those cards are also at the price that they are and in the decks that they are. Being prepared for all situations is always really key. Yeah, you pretty much nailed it, Stu. This is probably one of, if not the single best counter spell in the game. The reason that it has this price tag is because it is heavily played in a lot of different formats simply because of how many things it shuts down. It's kind of up there with counterflux for me because while counterflux may be able to counter a significant number of spells at once and can't itself be countered, Void Slime just has a much wider range of things that it could possibly stop, which basically includes anything from casting a spell to using almost any kind of ability. It can even stop your opponents from using their fetch lands to get other lands, which is rude, and I'm sure there are better things you could find to do with it, but just the fact that it can is so powerful. The only thing that kind of makes this a little bit difficult is the somewhat prohibitive colors in the mana cost. You have to have exactly two blue and one green, and it requires those two colors and nothing else. Aside from that, though, this thing is just ridiculously good, and the only thing that's really ever come close to matching it is the recent Disallow from the Kaladesh block, but even that is easier to cast at the same price, but doesn't do quite as much as this card does. Well, I think we're just continuing on the train of good blue cards here, partially blue anyway, with our next card coming in at number six for the price of about $7.50. We have a legendary, and it's Grand Arbiter Augustine IV. This is a four-drop creature, two, a white, and a blue, putting him in the Azorius colors. White spells you play cost one colorless less to play. Blue spells you play cost one colorless less to play. And all spells your opponents play cost one colorless more to play. He's also a 2-3 in terms of a body. Human Advisor, not really sure about the Advisor, but Human is a very relevant creature type. This Commander, and it is a Commander, don't you get me wrong, is pretty much the bane of everyone's day because it's just generically awesome in that it doesn't look all that flashy, but it's so good at what it does, which is tax, tax, tax the crap out of people. All your spells are going to cost at least one less when you play this guy as your commander. If they're blue and white, they cost two less, which is just amazing. And for every single spell your opponents play, they're going to have to check to see if they have that one extra mana up. It may not sound like a whole lot, but it gets really annoying after a while, let me tell you, as a guy who has played against Augustine many a time. I feel like it's pretty obvious where it goes best in the Azorius Control Shell, Pillow Fort type deck where you just pretty much monitor and police what everybody else does until you can somehow go in for the kill later. And this card, like many others we've talked about in the past, is when one when it hits the table, everybody will collectively groan and sigh because it's just not really all that fun unless you're the one playing it. Well, the player that will sigh and groan the most is definitely the one that has Soul Ring in their hand or just drew into Soul Ring and now has to pay two mana for that card. And that is the best insult to injury I've ever seen. This card's also really good in a lot of other ones, so it could be the Commander or it could be the 99. It's not uncommon to find this creature in a Brago deck, for example, because if you look at it, 
for four mana, you play this. Next turn, turn five, we'll say, you play Brago for two mana. Or even if Brago's hit the field and died, it gets rid of the tax for a full turn, which is really, really good. Rhystic Study gives players some flexibility because, you know, it's not a mandatory effect. But this one it is, and that is super, super cynical because it makes it so if they don't have any of the medallions out to lower their cost, which you are effectively getting in pairs, all players are going to have to pay so much more. It sets them back so many turns. It ruins so many combos and plays. It's just so powerful that, yes, people will hate playing against it, but you're going to love using it that much more. And Azorius colors really generally don't get all that much ramp. Augustine kind of in a semi sort of way provides the ramp that these colors sometimes desperately need to play out their high price finishers by effectively lowering the cost of all the spells you play, as I said, by either one or two. So that's yet another thing going for Grand Arbiter Augustine. Well, moving from one Azorius card to another, our number seven for $7 is Pride of the Clouds. This is a two drop, a single white, and a single blue for an elemental cat creature. Yes, cats. It has flying, and it also has the effect it gets a plus one one for each other creature in play with flying so that's pretty decent and it's on a 1-1 one, one body so it's got evasion it's got an effect it's got two mana i'd say relatively this passes the vanilla test but it also has the forecast effect which reads for four mana which is going to cost the same as grand arbiter augustine in this case two colorless and a white and a blue reveal pride of the clouds from your hand and put a 1-1 one, one white and blue bird creature token with flying into play. We've talked about forecast before in our hidden gems video and it has the effect in which you reveal this card on your upkeep and you pay that mana cost then to get the effect once. So it has the effect of being able to create little mini versions of itself for four mana which is double what it costs normally but you get to keep doing it over and over and over again unless for some reason you have to discard it or play it at your will. And again, if you do the forecast, you can then play this card later that turn, giving you inherently more bang for your buck if you really want it to. It's a solid card. It can grow your field. It's a little slow in that regards, but there is a lot of elemental support. And as we've seen with the new commander set, there is a lot of cat support now. I would love to see how this card fits into the new style now but it is a great card on its own. This is actually one of the few cards that I think the forecast ability is somewhat acceptable on. Because, let's be honest here, if you draw this early in the game, you're going to play it on turn two if you can. A 1-1 one, one flying guy on turn two is pretty decent. However, if you end up drawing this late game, that's when the forecast ability really kind of makes you think a little bit. You may only be able to use it once per turn. It may be overpriced for what it does, but what it does do that might make it worth it for some people is give you a sort of inevitability because the more flying guys you're able to build up with this and the more turns you're able to hold out on actually playing it, the bigger this guy is going to be when he comes into play and that can really make all the difference. He can be a late-game powerhouse in that sort of sense. Also, if you're playing just a generic flying tribal deck like good old Asperia the Inscrutable from our Hidden Gems segment, this card can be a huge flying beat stick. There are a few things against this card, though, in my opinion. One being that, other than its evasion, it really doesn't do a whole lot else. It just is a big flying beat stick, which is kind of boring to me. The forecast ability is also, I think, again, overcosted for what it is. I would say that three mana for that effect would not still be underpriced and would not really be all that dangerous. Another interesting thing to note about it, though, is that it gets plus one, plus one for each other creature with flying in play, period. Not that you control. So if your opponent has a couple random flying creatures out there, this guy's just going to get bigger because of it. The only reason I can see this commanding such the price tag that it has at the moment is simply because it's never been reprinted. That said, though, this is certainly a role player in any cool deck with flying, and hey, I love me some evasive creatures and one that gets bigger for just having other evasive creatures. Yeah, sign me up. Moving on to number eight on our list at $6, we have yet another blue card, and this one is another counter spell, actually. It's called Spell Snare, and it costs one blue mana to play. It is an instant, of course, and it says counter target spell with converted mana cost two. 
Yes, you read that right. This is a counter spell that only counters a very, very specific mana cost. I don't honestly know why this thing came about. I don't know the reasoning behind designing this card. However, this card commands a price tag because it is still lightly to moderately played in formats like Modern and Vintage, etc., etc., the reason being that there is a lot of stupid stuff you can do for just two mana. I mean, just off the top of my head, something like Doomblade, for example, some of the best removal in the game, Go Through the Throat is another example, is priced at two mana, Terminate, Dreadbore. I can come up with more and more of these as I sit here thinking about it. But also, some key ingredients in a deck like Storm also cost two mana, Mana Morphos, for example, and if you shut that down, they're probably going to be waiting a whole turn before they try to go off again. Spell Snare is a very reasonably priced counter spell, and it's very, very narrow, so I think, in my opinion, it would entirely be a metagame call, and I certainly wouldn't run this in any commander deck. But that said, this is a pretty darn good counter spell if you can use it, and some people sure can. Also to note, it's an uncommon. That shows you some of the power level of this set, and the fact that this is an uncommon like this is ridiculous. And like you were saying, Kyle, about the two drops, the more you start thinking about it, the more you realize exactly how many strong two drops there are, and that's the reason why you see cards like Isochron Scepter being played in decks, because being able to recur these two drops, which are extremely oppressive, is really, really terrifying. Counter spell is the greatest example of a two drop spell, and being able to counter a counter spell for one mana is really, really strong. Little niche in Commander, just for the fact that people love running big, stupid cards. Like, all right, yeah, give me a Protein Hulk, give me a Blight Steel, give me any Eldrazi. Yeah, that won't be able to stop them, and that is kind of the problem with it. But early game, super strong. Moving away from blue this time, and now into red, we're looking at an enchantment this time called War's Toll. Now, this card will run you about five and a half dollars, and it is an enchantment for four mana, three colorless and a red. And it reads, whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, tap all lands that player controls. If a creature an opponent controls attacks, all creatures that opponent controls attack if able. So right here we have two really awesome effects. So starting at the first one with the lands. Whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, tap all lands that player controls. So right here it prohibits any player from doing any kind of crazy combat tricks after their turn. So blue players or control players will typically leave mana open to cast instants. Well now they are with this decision of saying, hey, do I want to cast a creature and have a blocker out and waste all my mana for that? Or wait and save that so I can keep up a handful of counter spells or board wipes or etc. So right there it makes it so that they have hard plays. And also note this doesn't affect you, so you still get all the pleasure of playing stuff on other people's turns. Being that you're in red, you know, lightning bolts is the best example of which so you can keep up stuff for spot removal or beat face. The second effect of being able to make it so that whenever an opponent decides to attack, has to attack with their entire army, is super duper strong because there's tons of creatures that people don't want to attack with. Some commanders are better just to sit on the field than attack. So making it so that you can't use a creature's tap effect or making it so that you're attacking with something that's super weak or vulnerable is detrimental to an entire strategy. Yeah, I really like cards like this, sneaky kind of red cards. And one of the cardinal problems with red as a color is that it really likes to go all in, which kind of fails against more defensive strategies, which will just wait you out kind of hold you off, and then eventually overpower you. Red recognizes this is its weakness, so one of the things that it can do and the little tricks in its arsenal is cards like this and like Price of Glory that basically force everyone else to play down to its level. And that's very, very useful for pretty much all the reasons that you just described, Stu. I didn't, at first reading, catch the fact that this doesn't affect you, that's pretty darn powerful just from that alone. The real value here, even though the having to attack with all creatures at the same time is pretty powerful, that can backfire because you may get hit with a massive army of creatures, even if they don't really want to attack with all of them. I think the best part here is the fact that whenever a land is tapped for mana, all lands that player controls have to be tapped as well. That pretty much says either you're going to be playing stuff just on your own turn, 
or you're going to not be playing anything at all on your turn. As I said, this promotes a really all-or-nothing strategy, which is red's game, other colors, not so much. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Kyle, and I would say this even categorizes itself as a chaos card. But the thing is that I like about this chaos card is it doesn't affect you, and it also is a controlling chaos card in which you know the outcome, and it's going to penalize you about that. So it's super strong. This is probably one of my most favorite red cards in the game, honestly. Going from chaos to control and back to blue, of course, for our last card on the list here. At number 10, coming in at $5, we have Cytoplast Manipulator. This is a graft creature, which means it comes into play with two plus one plus one counters on it. Being a base 0-0, zero, zero, that makes it a 2-2 two, two for four mana, two colorless, and two blue. Also, whenever another creature comes into play, you can move a plus one plus one counter from Manipulator on to said creature. It could be on anyone's side, and that will become important in just a minute. Its other ability is to tap a blue and tap man the Manipulator to gain control of target creature with a plus one plus one counter on it as long as Cytoplast Manipulator remains in play. At first glance, you may not think this card is anything special, and you may in fact think that it's garbage. I sure did when I first looked at this. I thought a 2-2 two, two for 4 that can only take control of creatures with plus one plus one counters? What kind of garbage is this? You would be justified for thinking that if it weren't for the fact that, as people don't really realize in general, the graft ability is not just useful on your own creatures. You can graft plus one plus one counters onto other people's creatures. Most of the time, I grant you, that would be a bad move, but in this case, it's really not. And kind of the just mind-bendingness of this card makes me really, really like it. The fact that you can just tap one mana and tap a creature to gain control of something more or less permanently, as long as you can protect that Cytoplast Manipulator, you can keep the creature that you stole and just keep on stealing other creatures as long as you can figure out how to put counters on them. The only downside for this card is, number one, that it does kind of have the drawback of being so expensive to play and slow to be able to activate, and you have to jump through some hoops in order to make it work, granted. And number two... This card is only a 2-2, meaning once you move one counter onto a creature that somebody plays, probably your opponents in this case, it's a 1-1. One, one, and that means you can't really graft again without killing it and undoing all of your hard work. That said, though, this is a really cool card and one that can be quite powerful in a deck that throws a lot of counters around. Yeah, Experiment Crodge is one of the first spots that I would love to see this deck in, or even like an attracts if you're going for some form of counters proliferate build. And I mean, there's even lands that have graft on. Land of War Reborn is a great example of graft. So you can you do some sort of contingency, save graft, save the counter, and wait till it targets. But I would really love to see this deck in a Targets Matters deck, like Derevi. Now, whatever your status is on it, whether you think it's something that should be in Commander or not, is something that is really, really powerful for the fact that it targets. And it, you can do certain combos, like with Will Breaker, to have extremely overpowered things. Now, if you are using like Will Breaker as a target thing to kind of be your main focus, tutor it up, play it on the field, and keep gaining control of creatures that your opponents control, this is a great card to go with it because it can target, it can take on its own, and also for its effect, it doesn't have to remain tapped, which you typically do see for a lot of capture effects. Like Helm of Possession is a great example in which it has to stay tapped to keep the effect going. This isn't the case. So if you have some way to put more counters on this, this is fine. If you have ways to untap it, it's also fine. And I mean, you play this with doubling season, yeah, this is going to become really strong and really stupid really fast. So now at this conclusion, we have seen all the money cards, we have found our hidden gems, and now it comes time to rank Dissension. Kyle, want to tell us how we do that? Well, we kind of go on a scale here from several levels. We start down at the bottom at bronze, then we move up to silver, then up to gold, and then for the very best tip-top sets, we give a platinum rating out. So, Stu... What are you going to give Dissension on that scale? Dissension, for me, I want to give it a Platinum so bad, but 
I can't. And it's definitely not falling down to silver. It's locked solidly in the gold position for me. The main reason for this is that we see a lot of mechanics that are really strong. You see capturing effects. You see some really strong two drops like we saw before. With Night Creep, which is one of my favorite ones that I found in the Hidden Gems, that can be very oppressive and very strong if you use it the right way. My number one pick for my Hidden Gems, Hide and Seek, was an example of this in which you had the option of stealing stuff or you're removing stuff. And this card, as much as I'd love it to be entwined, it isn't. So you have to choose one or the other. And like this card, it's a great example for how I feel about this set. It has such great power, but there's little tiny niches in which I feel like it could have been a little bit better. The cards that have forecast are very, very strong, but they have the ability to be a little bit worse just for the fact that it has to be during your upkeep. It's a one turn effect unless you decide to play it again later. And it has the ability to make some sort of impact but it's very small at that now grant we do see some very strong cards like void slime which is one of the best counters in the game we also see some really good staples like condemn that we've talked about as well overall it is a very strong set and boy i wish i was around back then to draft it because this would have been incredible for seeing how this played but for me Gold is where my heart's going to let it be. Well, I think you're absolutely right, Stu, and I am going to give Dissension a gold rating as well. To recap, Ravnica is my favorite world in the Magic Universe, and the original and Return to Ravnica blocks are pretty much my two favorite blocks in Magic because I love the idea of the guilds and just the flavor of that world so, so much. That said, though, I think Dissension kind of gets the shorter end of the stick, as it were, because I think they mishandled the guilds in this set, although slightly, and my beef with Dissension is not from a card quality standpoint at all, it's from a synergy standpoint. Starting with the Azorius guild, I really don't see much synergy between the cards at all, and I'm not as generous as you, Stu. I think Forecast is a totally garbage, bogus ability and was a total waste of time. The Rakdos guild fared a little bit better, but Hellbent is such a non-intuitive ability because you want to empty out your hand to get better effects, but emptying out your hand is bad, so it was very confusing for a lot of players and is difficult to really make work as well as it could. Finally, going to the Simic Guild, they have probably the best synergy of all three guilds in this set, and probably the best cards overall, as you saw from some of my favorites, like Plax Caster, Frogling, Plax Manta, Trigon Predator. Almost all of my favorites pretty much fell into the Simic Guild. But again, Graft is a non-intuitive ability. People playing this set really didn't get the fact and continue to not get the fact that Graft could be used on opponent's creatures, and just the process of grafting counters from one creature onto another is sort of confusing. There's a lot of depth to the ability, which is cool, but it's not easy for newer players to understand, or even some older players to understand. I really like a lot of cards in Dissension. I love Cytoplast Manipulator, for example. I love controlling cards like Grand Arbiter Augustine. I love the combo pieces like Tide Spout Tyrant and Protean Hulk. But overall, I can't justify giving this set a platinum because the synergy really needs to be there for me, and it's just not here. That's totally fair, Kyle, and I think you pretty much summed it up how I want to, but just way more eloquently. A great set, and there's definitely value in it, and the good thing is is that we can use almost all these cards in Commander to even out the rough edges from this set. In all fairness, I still enjoy this set a whole bunch. Oh, agreed, absolutely. So that's our pool time for today, and if you enjoyed the cards and toys that we were playing with, be sure to check out our first segment in which we discuss our top 10 hidden gems that we found in this set. Also, what do you think of the money cards of Dissension? Do you play with any of these frequently? If you do, let us know your favorites down in the comments below. You can also hit us up on Twitter at mtgthecardpool or email us at mtgthecardpool at gmail.com. I'm Kyle Robertson. And I'm Stu Galetta, and we will see you next time at The Card Pool.